you picked up a video game at random, chances are the main character will be a gruff older man who's really good at killing things. But increasingly, chances are there'll be a gruff older man who's really good at killing things and is also a father. Whether it's Bioshock Infinite, God of War, Heavy Rain, Red Dead Redemption, Dishonored, Grand Theft Auto V, The Walking Dead, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, or The Last of Us, video games have become obsessed with the idea of fatherhood. In a 2010 Kotaku article, Stephen Totillo dubbed this phenomenon the daddening of video games. Where is all this dad stuff coming from, he asks. Is it the aging of gamers and the developers who make games? Perhaps. Today, the average age of a gamer is not 13, but 31. And Neil Druckmann, the creative director of The Last of Us, has talked about how becoming a father influenced the design of the game. But more important than why it's happening is the revolutionary effect it can have on video game storytelling. When Totillo wrote that article in 2010, he said that the games taught him that being a father is mostly about caring for someone who is fairly helpless. But many games have come out since then where that isn't really the case, where the child character isn't helpless. And the stories are about the parents' reaction to that. The results are games that rethink how to portray fatherhood, and by extension, masculinity. Today I want to look at two of the most significant and revolutionary games in this canon, The Last of Us and The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Why those two games specifically? Well, because in many ways they're in conversation with one another. Both feature a grizzled, violent male protagonist who can also be caring and responsible. Both are about this character's relationship with a surrogate daughter who is special in some way and has been sheltered all her life. And most importantly, both have nearly the exact same ending. Part 1. Spoiler Warning The Last of Us takes place in a post-apocalyptic world ravaged by killer fungus that turns people into mushroom zombies. You play as Joel, a man who lost his daughter at the beginning of the apocalypse and is still emotionally traumatized over that loss. During the game, you travel across America in an attempt to deliver Ellie to a laboratory. Ellie is a super special teenage girl with a unique biology that makes her immune to the fungus, which means she might be the only one who can save the world if scientists can develop a cure from her DNA. But after a long, long, long journey where the two characters form a father-daughter bond, Joel learns that Ellie will die during the procedure. And so, the main character, but not the player, is confronted with a choice between keeping the person they love alive or saving the world. The Witcher 3 takes place in the fantasy world of the continent, which is ravaged by war. You play as Geralt of Rivia, whose surrogate daughter, Ciri, is missing. During the game, you travel across the world in an attempt to find her. Ciri is a super special 20-something girl with a unique biology that makes her the only one capable of saving the world from the White Frost. But after a long, 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 long journey, Geralt finally finds Ciri, but learns that she may die in her attempt to stop the apocalypse. And so the main character, but not the player, is confronted with a choice between keeping the person they love alive or saving the world. The difference between the two narratives is this. The protagonists make the opposite choice. Part 2. The Last of Us and Violence in the finale of The Last of Us, Joel mows down waves of soldiers, storms into the hospital room where they are operating on Ellie, murders the doctors, and leaves with her. He then lies to Ellie about the entire thing. They've stopped looking for a cure. The final moments of the game reveal Joel to be psychotically possessive and entirely ego-driven. The Last of Us is a very episodic story, but each episode is, in a way, about contextualizing this decision that Joel makes at the climax. So let's go through them. In the first episode of the story, Tess sacrifices herself so that Joel and Ellie can survive. Together, her and Joel have led amoral lives, and she's hoping that she can redeem herself by helping Ellie. This is one path that Joel could take at the end of the game. Instead of sacrificing his life as Tess does, he could sacrifice what he wants most in order to do something that would benefit the world at large. In contrast to this is Bill, a grumpy old man who lives alone and who tells Joel that relationships are a burden that no one can afford in the apocalypse. Survival is more important than happiness. Once upon a time, I had somebody that I cared about. A partner. Somebody I had to look after. And in this world, that sort of shit's good for one thing. Getting you killed. So you know what I did? I wise the fuck up. And I realized it's gotta be just me. 
We also run into Joel's brother Tommy, who disagrees with both of those previous characters. Tommy used to be a Firefly, a group rebelling against military oppression, but he has left that idealistic life behind and now only cares about taking care of his family and friends. This isn't for me. Tommy, this is for your damn cause. My cause is my family now. In a twisted way, this is the same decision that Joel is making at the end of the game. Because Joel can't make the same decision that Tess made. Like Tommy, he can no longer sacrifice his own needs for the needs of the world, because he has been unable to follow Bill's advice. He loves Ellie like a daughter, despite himself. That relationship parallels the one between Henry and his brother Sam. You've got an older guardian and a younger ward, and what happens to Henry is what Joel fears will happen to him. Henry and Joel have a lot in common. Like Joel, Henry is willing to do anything to keep the person he is responsible for alive. Okay, we gotta get him up. I'm sorry. We're leaving. What? But ultimately, at the end of the episode, he fails when Sam gets infected. And Henry's response to this is to immediately commit suicide. The episode implies that Joel might make the same decision if Ellie dies. In fact, by throwing himself against the well-armed fireflies, he is already acting suicidally. For both Henry and Joel, life just isn't worth living without the people they love. Underlying all of these episodes are questions about what the correct use of violence is, who it should be directed against, and what is worth fighting for. Do you use violence to protect yourself only, or those you care about, or humanity at large? And nowhere is that exploration of violence more overt than in the penultimate chapter when Joel and Ellie come into conflict with a group of cannibals. The cannibals are led by David, a character who is a sort of dark mirror of Joel. In an article about the game, Bertrand Lucat pointed out that games where the protagonist is a father will often have another character who is not necessarily an antagonist, but who represent what that game thinks of as bad fatherhood. He calls these characters anti-fathers. Anti-fathers define acceptable or positive models of paternity in opposite to the warped flood or otherwise extreme models of patriarchal behavior that they display. Basically, the anti-fathers are so terrible that just by their presence we understand what being a good dad looks like. David is clearly framed as a fatherly figure, especially when he first meets Ellie. He presents himself as wise and kind and looking out for her interests. It's only later that his brand of fatherhood is revealed to be totally domineering and abusive. As a cannibal, David is obviously a man who uses violence improperly, but the game contrasts his actions with Joel so that we're questioning what Joel is doing as well. I mean, his last lines before being killed are these. You think you know me? Huh? Well, let me tell you something. You have no idea what I'm capable of. It's telling that Joel immediately steps into frame here because that line could have been said by him. It foreshadows the unspeakable act that he'll commit later on. Like David, Joel's fatherly kindness is an act. They are both monstrous. It's also an important scene because violence has catalyzed every major development in Joel and Ellie's relationship. Joel starts treating her as capable only after she first kills a man to save his life. This conversation... You're right. You're not my daughter. And I sure as hell ain't your dad. And we are going our separate ways. Get it together! is immediately followed by an attack, and that's immediately followed by them getting on the same page again. The violence seems to have solved the conflict between them and reminded Joel why he cares for her. And it's this moment that finally cements Joel as Ellie's father figure. It's me, it's me, it's me, look, look, it's me. The great potential of the daddening of video games is that it opens up this space where you can take these hyper-masculine characters, these giant cliches, and soften them up a bit, have them care for someone else instead of just being violent. The Last of Us does open that door a bit. Joel is masculine in every moment of the game, but his masculinity also allows for caretaking and empathy. And Ellie isn't helpless, but is clearly capable of handling herself and making her own decisions. At least until the very end, when it slams that door closed, when Joel rips away any chance for Ellie to make her own decisions, and the relationship becomes a toxic and manipulative one. Framing fatherhood solely through violence makes this relationship entirely about power. All of the early episodes with Tess, Bill, Tommy, Henry, they're all about Joel figuring out what he wants out of this relationship and out of life, and not really about what Ellie wants. The ending simply makes that relationship explicit. They are not equals in Joel's mind. On the other hand, Part 3, The Witcher and Empathy. 
The Witcher 3 is an enormous, incredible game that's about so many different things it's impossible to fully put your arms around it. But the most important through line for me is how it allows Geralt to be a positive and supportive father figure. It's what makes Geralt a unique character in the landscape of video game dads. I mean, on a superficial level, he is the epitome of a male power fantasy. It's like, oh yeah, look at this guy, he's so strong, he can kill anyone or anything, he's got like a hundred scars, he gets to dress like a samurai and nobody minds. His voice sounds like he chugs gravel, he gets to solve crimes like Batman, he has enhanced senses like Wolverine, and he has sex with practically every woman he meets like James Bond. Don't you want to be him? Well. Not exactly. It would have been very easy for the developers to make a game with this character that was merely a juvenile power fantasy. Instead, the world is constantly taking Geralt down a peg. Because of his status as a witcher, people treat him like dirt and constantly harass him. A witcher? Never thought the Baron would stoop to hiring a monster slayer. Unlike many fantasy protagonists, he's not a legendary hero or the chosen one to save the world. He's just a guy. So the game isn't about the player getting to vicariously feel like the most important person in the universe. Where Joel would lash out at anyone who challenged him, you can play Geralt in a way where he always remains restrained. It's impossible to emasculate him because he doesn't take the bait. It's why he feels more masculine and mature than many of his counterparts. The most important example of this is at the game's brilliant climax, where Geralt, unlike Joel, stands aside as his daughter chooses to save the world even though she might die. There are three endings to the game, and in one of them, Ciri doesn't survive. In his grief, Geralt then goes on a suicidal mission to kill the one remaining secondary villain in the story. It's the Henry episode all over again. The father can't live with the guilt of letting his child die. And it's the bleakest of the three endings. But the ending the player gets depends entirely on how Geralt treats Ciri during the final stretch of the game. And it's here that the game makes its ideology about what fatherhood is explicit. In five key moments, Ciri will struggle to cope with the pressures of being the chosen one, and Geralt can try to help her. If he is patronizing, controlling, greedy, or insensitive, then Ciri will lose faith in herself at the climax and will not survive. If instead, Geralt is supportive, emotionally intelligent, confident in her abilities and empathetic, then the player will get one of two endings where Ciri does survive. These are actually really easy to screw up if you're coming into them thinking that Geralt must act like an authority figure, as someone who's only interested in having Ciri fulfill her responsibilities. So how do you make the right choices? And more importantly, how does the game guide you in making those choices? Well, in The Witcher 3, Geralt is constantly meeting other fathers who have different methods of raising their children, which tie directly into the choices Geralt makes concerning Ciri. For instance, at one point in the game, Ciri has to meet with the Lodge of Sorceresses. Geralt can either be an overly protective father figure by accompanying her to the meeting, or he can choose to demonstrate confidence in her by letting her go alone. If the player lets her go alone, it might be because they've been influenced by the example set by Krak on Crate. This character is the head of a noble house in the kingdom of Skellige. His two children are candidates to become the next monarch. And while he initially bemoans how headstrong they both are, he is ultimately confident in their abilities. This includes his daughter Ceres, who you can help become queen. And if the player, Geralt, and Crack on Crate all believe that she's capable of ruling a country, then you should also be able to believe that the equally headstrong Ciri can handle one meeting on her own. The other two major father figures that Geralt encounters are anti-fathers, much like David in The Last of Us. Like David, they are both the leaders of societies, and also like David, they are both men of violence. So let's talk about the Bloody Baron. During the search for Ciri, Geralt encounters Philip Stenger, who has set himself up as the Baron in war-torn Velen. Philip is also searching for missing loved ones, his wife and daughter, and during your time with him you learn that he is a drunk, violent, abusive, and neglectful father. He's just every bad dad trope rolled up into one. His daughter, Tamara, has virtually no positive memories of him. My earliest memories are of a drunken father lying under the stairs caked in mud and clutching a bottle. Next dozen years? pretty much the same. She's filled with resentment over her father's absences and abuses, and acts recklessly as a way to rebel against him. In many of his scenes, Philip is remorseful about his crimes, but he is never absolved of the harm he has caused. 
Tell him one gesture could never make up for a ruined childhood. He provides a stark warning for Geralt and for the player about the consequences of the misuse of violence and of neglecting the needs of your children. If the player remembers the Bloody Baron, then they might make the right decision during this scene when Ciri is frustrated by her inability to control her magical powers. If Geralt tells her to relax, he basically dismisses and diminishes her concerns, and in the scene that follows, they struggle to communicate with one another. Yeah, pull me another. The fact that they're getting drunk is also reminiscent of the Bloody Baron's drinking. But if Geralt chooses the other option, then the two have a snowball fight, and Ciri returns to her studies with newfound vigor. She gets what Tamara never did, a father who is present and pays attention to her. The other major anti-father of the game is Tywin Lannister. Sorry, Amir von Emrys. They're both played by Charles Dance and are essentially the same character. Amir is the Emperor of Nilfgaard, and Ciri is his heir. Throughout the game, he wants Geralt to find Ciri and return her to him so that she can fulfill her aristocratic duties. And if the players remember Amir during one of the critical choices with Ciri, then they might make the right choice. At one point in the game, Ciri feels betrayed by one of her closest friends, Avalok, who she realizes doesn't actually care about her. Avalok just wants Ciri to fulfill her grand destiny in the same way that her actual father wants her to fulfill her royal destiny. When this happens, Geralt can tell her to stay calm, but it's definitely something that Amir would do, since he is an incredibly cold and emotionless character who demands total decorum from everyone around him. That choice leads to a scene where Geralt puts a necklace on Ciri that is a reminder of her duties. The framing of the scene definitely makes it feel like Geralt is attempting to control Ciri's actions in the same way that Avalok and Amir were. If Geralt chooses the other option, then they go completely against decorum and vent their anger together by wrecking Avalok's secret lair. So, if the player is paying close attention to how each of the other father figures in the story are framed, then they'll be prepared to emotionally support Ciri at these key moments in ways they might not have expected were the right ways to act when they started playing the game. If you make the right call the majority of the time, then Ciri will survive the climactic battle at the end, and you'll get one of two endings. In one, Ciri becomes a witcher alongside Geralt, and in the other, Ciri chooses to go back to Nilfgaard and become Empress. For me, this has always been the most fitting ending of the story, even though it's definitely not the happiest. Geralt must once again step aside and allow Ciri to make her own decisions, even though it's not what he wants. Is this what you want? Yes. You're not trying to stop me. Take me to the Blue Mountains by force. Traveled half the world to find you, but I never intended to force anything on you. I know. By saving her life, but losing her company, this ending gives consequence to Geralt's actions. He's making the right choices, regardless of how painful it may be for him. And in contrast to nearly every other game made during the daddening of video games, The Witcher 3 presents fatherhood as something that is about being supportive and empathetic, about inspiring confidence and offering advice, and in the end, knowing that there's only so much you can do. Eventually, you have to let go. Conclusions and caveats. If you've been paying attention to the critical discourse around video games for any length of time, then you'll know that there is a, let's call it a resistance to any discussion of gender roles in the medium. But in The Last of Us and The Witcher 3, we have two games where the story is so inextricably bound up in playing with the notions of fatherhood and masculinity that it's almost impossible to say anything about them without dipping your toes into discussions of those topics. And more importantly, here we have two games that appeal to a male audience but are in many places revolutionary in their depictions of masculinity. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have shortcomings. There is much that could be said about the sexualization of all of the female characters in The Witcher and the constant brutalizing of women in the story things that could potentially undermine what the game is trying to do in other areas. That's a topic that would easily double the length of this essay. In contrast, Neil Druckmann has said he wanted to make a game with a badass heroine who wasn't sexualized, and largely succeeded at delivering on that. But in short, while video games have been dominated by hypermasculine protagonists, a new wave of games have featured fathers as the main playable character. Among those games, The Last of Us and The Witcher 3 use those tropes to explore new definitions of masculinity, ones which open up spaces for equal relationships instead of relationships where one person is in the dominant position. Of the two, The Last of Us only teases us with that possibility and makes it an explicit part of its tragedy that it is not achieved at the end. Whereas in The Witcher, the relationship between Geralt and Ciri is one of gaming's best examples of a truly positive and mutually respectful father-daughter relationship. And that, more than anything else, is what makes The Witcher such an important game.
Like a lot of people, The Witcher 3 was the first piece of Witcher media I ever encountered, which is a little strange considering that it is chronologically not only the conclusion to a series of games, but to the book series as well. While putting this essay together, I started listening to the books on Audible, the sponsor of this video. Typically, I only ever listen to non-fiction audiobooks because I find it hard to follow along with the story if it's a piece of fiction intended for the page. But surprisingly, I had no trouble listening to the narration by Peter Kenny, and I think it's because he used uses very distinct voices for each character so that you're never confused about who's speaking. If you want to listen to the book series that inspired these games or any audiobooks at all, then go to audible.com slash just right or text just right to 500 500. You'll get three months of Audible for just $4.95 per month, so it's like getting three months for the price of one. Thanks for watching everyone, and again a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for supporting this channel and for patiently waiting for this video. Keep writing everyone. Oh, <laughs>